Today, we're going to talk about valuation. That is one of the key, there's an echo here, I can't find it. Why? That's one of the key issues that people have. I'm going to lock screen sharing, and I am going to mute the participants. Great, so I can uh, so I can talk without uh, the screen. Can um, do you have a problem with the uh, with the screen? Okay, good. Okay, so what I see there is a is a call. So it's somebody calling there. Let me just uh, get that out because we have great content today and. Okay, I'm going to see these and good, good. Now we're there. Now we are here. Okay, great. Thank you. So, evaluating an idea. That is what we're going to talk about. I have good news for you and bad news for you, of course. What is the value of the idea? The value of an idea is zero. The value is not in ideas, the value is on execution. Okay, the value is on the execution, not on the ideas. And this is what happens. If you have great ideas and you don't want to share it because you're afraid somebody might steal them from you, you might as well not do anything. Because without sharing those ideas, you cannot improve the ideas. And you remember when I told you that you had to be passionate about your idea. The reason why I said that is because it has been proven that Resilience and persistence is the key to success. Resilience and persistence. That is why you need to understand why whatever it is that you're doing is important to you. Because chances are you're going to fail and you're going to fail a lot. And the best way to keep you alert and focused is to know that you're doing this because this is important to you. Not only, not only because you're going to get rich, which is... Um, one of the biggest problems that we have as investors, but because you're going to create an impact. So you think in impact, how are you helping people do wonderful things? What is, are the things that you're going to leave as a legacy? That is how you create wealth. That's, this is not about making money. This is about creating wealth. So if we go back to what other sources of funds, which I'd like to refer to, uh, let me just get back to here. So if we go back to the sources of funds, the value of the idea has uh, a different range according to who is giving you the funding. Okay, if you're going to family, friends, and founders, the value of the idea could be very high, but you can only go so far. Because in order to grow a company or an idea, you need the involvement of others. They are Three types of value if you have a for-profit, even if you have a B Corp. For those who do not know what a B Corp is, it's a new organization that has a dual purpose, for impact and for profit. Uh, and there's more than a thousand companies registered so far. We are a B Corp. It only started last November. And it's a new trend in, social, in um, conscious capitalism, which is what we're teaching as well. If you have a for-profit, if you have any form of profit evaluation in your idea, there are three ways, three ways that you can value the idea. The first way is by the amount of money that you put in, that is usually cost, called cost value. The second way is what is called book value, and that has to do with accounting. And the third way is called market value. And that is referred to the perceived value that others have on your idea. That is if you have a profit measurement. If you have a cost or a nonprofit, or if you are a government uh, servant, or if you work for the government, then you have two ways of valuing the idea. One way is the benefits to others, and the other way is the impact. And this can be very tricky because for some people, the impact has to be massive to, a lot of, to reach a lot of people. 
in some for some other sponsors or backers the impact has to be profound so you either go making a large impact for a lot of people like for example uh tiva and funding for the poor and you have with a little bit of money you have you have the multiplier effect that would have impact in a lot of people that's one type of valuation and the other type is you have very few people that you impact or very few communities that you impact but the impact is very deep and when you do it that way what you want to do is you want to prove that your method works so other people can replicate that is what tiva did tiva was a, uh, an organization that provided loans micro loans uh, like the Grammys bank and what you did was what they did was they proved that it worked so other people could replicate the method. These are uh, nonprofits or causes. If you want to do a cause, for example, you might want to do a cause for um, keeping your uh, environment clean or having your um, pets safe or your children well educated or with nutrition. There is some things that you cannot value with money that you only value with impact. So there's the two types, for profit, and for impact. And the B Corp sits in the middle, for profit and for impact. That's what we do here, and many companies are going that way as well. So let's go back to the for profit. As I, as I mentioned before, you can, leave your, uh, you can leave your questions here. That is the chat, so you can leave questions. You can send me a private questions through there. But I'm gonna start with the for profit because that is what most people are uh, used to. The first method of evaluating is by costs. So cost, if you have the appropriate rec record of costs, if you can value the cost, the expenses that you have, you should start putting them all in. In terms of um, ownership of the idea, that is something called sweat equity. Part of the sweat equity is the cost that you have in court in already however there's two problems with having a cost value one is that the cost value might not reflect all the effort and the wisdom that you put into the company or the idea chances are that if you're a mature person you have been thinking about this and working about this for two or three decades and you could just not measure all the time that you have put into this. So that is one of the problems that you have with costs. The other problem that you have with cost is that in some cases you get grants from the government or from nonprofits that are gonna help you get your idea to a place where you can express, you can have a prototype. And those grants provide what is called a false valuation. That has been my experience. I'll give you an example. I see a lot of businesses from overseas. And those businesses have usually received some funding from their own government or from nonprofits or for business associations, which are a, sort of a blended mix. So I see a lot of people that come here and say, well, we spend a million dollars or half a million dollars or $200,000 on this idea. And they can show, they have the proof that they have received the money. The problem is that that money does, is not relevant to the value of the idea. So you have that dual problem with cost because you can have a government or you can have a grant giving you some funds, especially if you work at universities, giving you some grants, and that grant, part of that grant goes to administrative costs. So it's hard for an investor to say, well, how is this portion of the cost relevant to this prototype or this idea. Chances are also that those um, grants are inflated because they have to consider a lot of other things that are in business are inefficient. So there, that is a trick when you do cost valuation. Personally, I don't recommend it. Cost valuation is traditionally used by um, business consultants that are not very familiar with venture capital or with angel investing. 
Um, and that is that is a problem. It could be valuable to a loan or to a um, a lender of different forms. But in reality, I don't like to use cost. Uh, but I needed to explain to you why so you can think about it. The second form of valuation is what is called the book value. And the book value, if you have a if you have an Excel sheet of the of a company, and I'll give you some examples here. It, the book value refers to what it is that you have created and it can be very complicated and you can find this in the book but I'm going to put some some sheets as well so as you can tell it's not very easy but it is the value that you have created through your activities that is recorded from an accounting perspective what does that mean that means that you have your cost allocation that means that you have your investment allocation and that means that you have your revenue allocation I'm going to go through that a little bit with a little bit more detail because I want you to be 100% uh, sure of what I mean and I want you to be able to use this information so you know when you're talking to people um, if it is more convenient for you to use it or not. Book value is traditionally used in lending. That is what we use mostly in lending with a discount. I'll explain the discount a little bit uh, uh, along the way. So the book value is this. You have equity that you have put into the business or into the entity initially. That is some capital that you put in initially so you can pay for the resources. Then you have paid for the resources. So the first influx of capital goes into the balance sheet in something called equity. That equity is used to pay for resources that are going in the assets uh, column of the balance sheet. Those assets, uh, that, those assets and those resources are also exhausted, some of them. Some of them decrease the value and some of them increase the value. To make things very, um, uh, to give you the um, napkin overview about how those concept works, works think about this. If the resources that you use are exhausted to create value for your clients and users, I will call that expense. If the resources that you use are used to create value and to accumulate in value, I would call that investments. So it depends how you use it. To give you an example, the cost of this call is an expense for me, but if I can reuse this call for marketing purposes and in all of my programs, it is also an investment because I don't have to do it again. It helps me build value into the future. So when I'm gonna allocate the costs, from an accounting perspective, I can separate and I could put part of this as an expense and part of this as an investment. Why is this important? Because the value, the book value of your company is the equity value of your company. So if you put everything as an expense and you do not generate the revenues that you expect to generate, because you don't expect to generate them, then you have a negative profit and that reduces your equity. So it is a mathematical equation. If you put part of your expenses as investments because you expect to create something in the future and then you use this as an asset called intellectual property or intellectual capital, which could also include training for your employees, for example, or branding, then that doesn't affect your expenses in another financial statement called income statement or profit and losses, and then your equity stays a little bit higher. So when you're using book value, book value is referred to the equity, and because it is referred to the equity, you need to have a conversation with an accountant because you can decrease or increase the value of the equity based on your strategy. And remember that businesses don't make decisions. People make decisions. So you can always make decisions within the norms that are accepted worldwide. 
So that is the second form of valuation. Cost valuation, book valuation. Book valuation is defined by your equity value, and you do have to have the involvement of the accountants to do that. But the third type of valuation is the valuation that maximizes the value of your company. Therefore, it also maximizes its impact, and it also maximizes the return that you have on that, on your investment as a business owner or as an entity or project manager. How do you calculate your market value? Think, for example, in a pair of jeans. So we can all relate to a pair of jeans. We know what a pair of jeans is, and we can realize that the pair of jeans has a different market value according to many things. The availability of the jeans, the brand expectations that we have, the trust that we have in that brand. So to have a high market value, you need to establish trust and a present and a brand equity. You need to be consistent about your brand. When I, um, when I teach scientists how to create value or wealth from their research, the first thing that comes to mind for many inventors and scientists and creative people is the value of the achievement. You created something very useful and therefore there is a value there. Now remember that I told you that ideas don't have any value. If you have a working prototype of something, that has a different value. But the real value comes when people use that. So there are two ways of having market value. The market value is related to the future value that you can extract for, from something that you created. And you can extract that value in two ways. Two ways. That value is tied to the revenues that you generate. So there are only two parts of that equation. One part is the number of users, and the second part is the value that those users assign to what you offer. If you have a product or service and you sell it, then that is part of the value, but then you can also have those users buy in a recurring way, so you have more value into the future. So those are the two ways that you have, that you express market value. And you can think, for example, that companies that have a high number of users, for example, the, the most recent examples are Instagram and, um, and one that is not that, that new is, was Hotmail. They had a very large number of users. Because they have a very large number of users and they have something interesting, it would have a very high value for a company that wants to have access to those users to provide them with some offers of their own. So that is how you maximize value. A lot of people in business think that the maximum value is gained in the public market. Or a, a, the public market, it depends on the country, uh, but the public market is in the US is the market that refers to the stock market where people like you and me and John and David and Julia and whoever it is and Anne can buy stocks. Because they are open, the government regulates that. that that's what it means, open or public uh, um, market. It depends on the country. Some countries call it open, some countries call it public market. But that is the stock market. A lot of people think that the highest value that they can get for they, their company when they, they, once they grow it is um, an initial public offering, which is the offer to the stock market. I particularly don't find that is the maximized value. I think the maximized value comes when you have a synergy and you find that somebody can benefit, another company or another platform can benefit by incorporating you to them. That also applies to nonprofits. You can build a nonprofit and you can merge it with another nonprofit and you can add value to them. So, to wrap up the market value, because I want to go into the, into the nonprofit part. To wrap up the market value, the maximizing market value comes from synergies when another company or entity can benefit from your existing platform of clients, or they can offer your services, whatever it is that you offer your clients to their clients. So if you want to maximize market value, make sure that you have a platform of users and that they have bought something that you offer. Those are the two ways. 
And then you can expand that into repeat purchases, which has another value. Then you can go into uh, a series of uh, Excel exercises. We're going to provide some of those templates on, on the course that we're going to have. But it's, then it becomes a mechanical exercise. How many people can you reach? How, how often do they buy from you? How much does it cost to serve them? And what is the net profit? And then you have what is called a customer value. Now, if you are starting a company, what I suggest that you do, or if you want to grow the company, is really, really focus on getting a lot of users in, in a platform of users and customers. That is the best way to grow your value. I want to go now into, um, uh, yeah, I'll get the questions. I'll get that question later. I want to go back uh, now into the nonprofit sector. The nonprofit sector values impact, and you can value impact in several ways. Chances are that sponsors and backers for the nonprofit sector also want to be recognized. You remember that I told you that, that you needed to recognize them. So it could have a big impact for them. And what you want to know is you want to know how they select the people that they support so you can align what is your idea to their ideas. Now, one of the main issues that I have that I find with causes and nonprofits is that they have a one-time event and then they forget about it. You need to think strategically. In reality, Nonprofits need to work as efficiently as for profit, only that the results of their operation have a different um, measurement. But a lot of people think that nonprofits need to be slack. I know because I created two and I work in another one and I'm in the board of several nonprofits. And nonprofits, they need to be efficient because they need to constantly provide that value to their backers. So when you have, when you have an idea that can transform the world, if you want to continue with that idea and you want to grow that idea, you need to make sure that your activities provide value and that you can be self-sustained, self-sustainable. Otherwise, it's going to end and you're not going to maximize the value of that idea. Now, make sure that when you have a cause or a nonprofit, you are very, very vocal. You need to tell people what it is that you're doing. That is what adds value. People need to know what are you doing. They need to talk about it. And if customers are important in a for-profit sector, users are important in a non-profit sector. Why? Because a company would back you up if you can show them that you have a lot of users that would know that your services or your products are uh, available to them because you have important backers. So it is very, very critical that you know who your users are and you keep referring to them. That is very, very important. So make sure that you have those users or customers. Just think about it. It's always about who's using your offering and how are you benefiting them. So that is the way that we value Nonprofits. The same thing applies to a cause, only that a cause has a very limited time span. So you can do a lot of things with causes. If you are not sure if you want to start a nonprofit, what I recommend is that you start with a cause. Uh, I'll be happy to exchange ideas with you if that's what you want to do. Send me an email or send us an email or put the questions on um, on Facebook or Twitter or uh, LinkedIn or Pinterest or on our web. Um, and try to start with a cost first and then define how is it you want to do it in the future. Uh, if you have a project for a company, the same thing applies. You need to show how you're going to benefit and who are your users. That's how you have the value, the maximized value. So I'm gonna, I have two questions here that I want to answer, and um, you, can, you can write, uh, you can add more questions here. So one question came through Facebook, and it is, can I find users overseas? And the answer is yes, you can. Now, what are you going to do with those? those clients defines what it's called the delivery system. You need to be able to deliver what you want to deliver. 
In this day and age, a lot of people deliver things online. So we have Amazon, um, we have our books over there uh, that people can buy, but sometimes the cost of shipping of the book overseas is more expensive than the book itself. So we have digital products. If you have digital products, then um, you can actually go pretty much anywhere in the world. The only problem that you have when you sell internationally is a tax issue. And if you sell physical products, then you have to deal with how you're going to make the delivery. Now, there are three costs to delivering something. One is the design and the marketing cost. So that's the achievement and the acquisition of the clients. That, that's the design. The other one is the production. And the other one is the delivery and the support. So those are three things you need to think if you're selling internationally. Are you going to use somebody else to help you design to that particular market? Who's going to produce it? And how are you going to take it to the clients? When I lived in Australia, I, um, I crafted a career as an international speaker. So I had to physically move to places. But I also had my books and my DVDs. And in different places, I had allocated partners that could sell them. So they took care of the delivery. If I, have, if I was in Korea and somebody wanted to translate a book, then I had to engage into somebody to produce it and to design the book to the Korean market. So those are the things that you need to see. There is on SlideShare a SlideShare that we created about born global companies. So if you want to go global, definitely try to find that. I'll send that link on, uh, on the um, summary of this call for tomorrow. If you have, yes, okay. If you have an international market, chances are that your valuation can go up. However, if you want to have a, an international presence and you cannot fulfill that presence, your valuation will come down. So make sure that that is something that you can accomplish. Okay, the other question was about nonprofits. Can I start a nonprofit in one country and move it to the other? and ask for donors. You can ask for donors. It is hard to start a nonprofit in one country and move it to the other country. There are countries that are very, it's very easy to set up a nonprofit. I find that the European countries, especially the Eastern European countries are in some parts are easier. In the Nordic countries, it's easier than here. Uh, in Australia has a different regulation. Uh, so make, it depends where you are. So establishing a nonprofit is very geographically oriented. You can start a company in one region to serve another region, and uh, you can get funded by that. There's usually very strict regulations about what you can do and you cannot do with the funds that you receive. I started a nonprofit in Venezuela, and I started a nonprofit in Australia. So those are the two countries where I have um, a lot of uh, experience, and I'd be happy to share that with you. Okay. Okay. Now the other question is about taxes and book value and accountants. If you're going to do book value, definitely go with an accountant in your local country. You can move a company from one country to the next. I've done that, but what I found that was easier for me was to set up if I was moving to set up a company in one country and have that company buy the company from another country. Uh, to me, that was more practical and uh, more, uh, more cost effective than doing it all the way around. You do not have to start a company in the US in Nevada or Delaware, which are the uh, states where people usually do that. Um, they, it's very common, but you don't have to. You can, you can do it pretty much in any state. You need to have an agent in that state. And um, that, that doesn't affect, that doesn't affect your valuation. No, it doesn't affect your valuation. If you're going to ask for funds in the U.S., you need to have a presence in the U.S. I, I know people say they've done it in any other way. I haven't found that. That has not been my experience. Either requesting funds, helping people request funds, or investing. Um, I'm Sand Hill Angels. We're a group of angel investors. We don't invest overseas. You need to have a presence here. Uh, and that has been the case of many venture capitalists. Get an office here, get a presence here. Good. 
Well, with this, I'm going to close the recording. Thank you so much for being here. Um,